of that, thank you for the instrumentals and for all those that play the instruments here in church this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We're glad that you're here, and uh, God has blessed us with some sunshine, a little bit of warmth outside, not too much, but uh, we're, so, we're thankful for the seasons that God has created. Let me ask you an all-important question. Are you glad you're born again and you're saved? Amen. 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 Then let's sing about salvation, shall we please? If you'll take your songbooks, I believe the words will be on the screen. 431, 431 as we sing about salvation found in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all three stanzas. Sing from your heart. <clears throat> we're so thankful that we're born again and saved. We're a child of God. Let's sing about that so great a salvation. Join me please now. I found a friend. salvation that there be any here today does not know you as their savior that today would be the day they accept the wonderful gift of salvation through faith in our lord jesus christ father we pray lord just bless our time here together this morning we thank you for all those that are here to each family that's represented for it's in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you you may be seated See you. 
praise the Lord. I just want to mention this morning that for this year, some of our folks, some of our loved ones, some of our church family, some of our blood family uh, have realized uh, that a brighter day is there for them. And um, Sue Hall passed away yesterday, one of our church members. And Sue Hall used to sing in the choir right over there. Sue, when we first started up the choir years ago, I announced to the church, I said, we'd like to get a little, men, uh, little adult choir going. And, and there was Henry and Sue singing in the choir. And she's been sick for four years. Couldn't breathe. And uh, it was a brighter day for her, amen, a brighter day. And uh, Miss Diana, it's a brighter day. Uh, and Mary Gillespie, a brighter day. I'm glad for all the joy God gives us in this world. There's a lot of joy in this world, a lot of goodness that God gives us, family, and, and a lot of things we enjoy. But there is a brighter day coming Amen. when we shall see the Lord and know the Lord. And God shall wipe all tears away, away from our eyes. And I was in a conversation with someone not long ago. They said, well, how can, it be, how can we really have no grief when we'll know that our loved ones, maybe that were lost, are not with us and so forth? God's going to wipe all that from our mind. And there won't be a memory anymore. This song says this, it won't even be a memory. All the things that have, that have grieved us here. There is a brighter day of coming. Praise the Lord. And we look forward to it. We say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Would you like to sing this little chorus with us? Of course you would. Let's all stand and try it. Amen. The choir sang the chorus three times. I, I know the bass part. I don't know the melody too well. But let's try this. Just the chorus now. Sing the chorus. Try to get it. Here we go. There's a brighter day a coming soon our heartaches will be gone sorrow won't be a memory in the light of heaven's dawn sing the chorus one more time asking for the Hall family you'll give comfort and grace we're going to miss Sue we're going to miss her and her family indeed will miss her we're thankful for her faithful testimony we're thankful for her servant's heart and Lord this has been a hard uh, few months for our church family we've lost some great people and said goodbye to some great saints and some wonderful servants of Christ yeah. and uh, we're thankful that they're at home we're thankful their race was done we're thankful that they were able to see our Jesus face to face <laughs> And Lord, until our time, until you come or until you call us, may we just remain faithful and serve as long as you give breath and strength to these bodies. And thank you for the opportunity to gather with the saints today on this Sunday morning. We look forward to it. We're thankful for it. And we pray we'll be challenged and grow in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You remain standing, Brother Pat will introduce another song for us. Thank you, sir. 363 in your songbooks, please. The words will be on the screen. 363, the song that asks the question, would you live for Jesus and always be pure or good? That, always be pure and good. That's a challenge for all of us, including myself. Let's live unto him, amen. Walk the straight and narrow way that he wants us to live. 363, join me on the first stanza. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good?
by an instrumental right now. <coughs> Thank you, ladies. Beautifully done. Boy, Fanny Crosby penned the word so beautiful to that song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Praise God. Thank you. That was wonderful. Praise God. 411 in your song books, and then we're going to be favored by another special. 411, will I ask that you stand, please? I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you I'll give. It is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. 411, the words are on the screen. Join me, please. I'm a message from the Lord, hallelujah.
seated. We are going to be favored right now by a young ladies ensemble. So girls, you come and sing for the glory of God. singing about Jesus. Amen? Amen? He is our Savior. Someone else give me a name of Jesus. He goes by many names in the Bible. What's another name of Jesus, Jesus in the Bible? We got Emmanuel over here. Nick? Great the Great Physician. Gene? Jehovah? Jehovah. Wonderful Counselor? Wonderful counselor. Shaddai. El Shaddai, the Mighty God? Amen. Bright Morning Star? Star Prince of Peace? The Great I Am? The great I am. The lily of the valley. This side's winning, by the way. <laughs> right, Gene? We're winning. <laughs> it's not a contest, right? Um, praise the Lord. Anybody else got a name of Jesus that you wanted to uh, mention? Yes, ma'am? Elohim? Anybody else got a name of Jesus? Alpha and Omega? The bread of life? Living water? Right? Ancient of days. Who said something over here? The door. the door. Praise the Lord. I am the door. Jean? I am. I am. Who said I am the way? The way, the truth, and the life. Master. Yes, sir? Master. What's that? Master. Say it again. Master. Master. Father. Father. Right? Christ is a name that we haven't mentioned yet. Christ. Um, what does the name Jesus mean? What about Emmanuel? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Yes, and Jesus is, is uh, Jehovah or Joshua or the Old Testament form of Jehovah. And um, what a wonderful Savior we have, amen? And uh, he goes by many names, but I like the way the young ladies sang it. I call him Lord. Praise God for that. Would we all be able to turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 22 this morning? Luke chapter number 22. If you don't mind, we'll preach on Jesus this morning. We've sung about him, we've talked about him, we've named him, we've prayed to him, and now we'll preach about him. 
The Bible says that in all things he might have the preeminence. We studied that yesterday in a men's Bible study. Jesus Christ has the preeminence. And by him all things consist, the Bible says. And I like the way the New Testament also says it, that he should have glory in the church. And Jesus Christ deserves and I think fitly uh, receives the glory of our church and our gathering here today. Uh, we've not come for a fashion show. We've not come just for fellowship. We've come for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And um, we're going to be reading in chapter number 22 of this uh, chapter where we've been for several weeks. And I want to uh, sort of give you the, uh, the, the subject matter and the title that I have sort of placed on this message this morning. And that is, Jesus is always in control. Jesus is always in control. And I'll begin in verse 39 and read all the way through verse 53. So beginning in 39 of Luke 22 and ending with verse number 53. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples. He found them sleeping for sorrow. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and of the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief, with swords and staves, when I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. You know, Luke is uh, unique. Uh, the, the whole Bible is unique. It's, a, it's, it's God's book. It's, it's, it's what we cherish. The choir is working on a song about the Bible, how glad we are to have a Bible. Uh, but there are things in Luke's gospel that are not found in the other three. I think more so than any of the other three. Not, there's more unique things in Luke's gospel than the other way around. And in this passage that we just read, Luke is the only one to record for us that Jesus said, this is your hour. And the power of darkness. And I started to think, why, why, is, why is that only found in, in the Gospel of Luke? And why isn't it in any other of the, of the Gospel story narratives? Matthew and, and Mark and John. Uh, well, if you'll allow me to read from the beginning of the book Luke. Here's how Luke starts his book. He says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things, which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which was from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the first, to write unto thee in order most excellence the- Theophilus. And when you think about those three verses, it seems to say that Luke wrote later than Matthew, Mark, and John. And so Luke was able to read the the the. The, 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 the narrative, the gospel narrative of the other disciples. And Luke was able to set in hand, as he says at the beginning of this book, I wanted to set in hand beyond those things that were witnessed. I wanted to set in hand so that we might understand perfectly, O excellent Theophilus. 
And so Luke was able, under the inspiration of God, to add in some of these details that are not found in the other Gospels. And I, in my study, as many of you have studied the Bible, there's times when you just put it in park. You know, when you're driving through Scripture, and you come to a place, and just for some reason you feel like you need to park. And you stop, and you put it in park, and you turn the car off, and you just enjoy that place. That passage, that verse, those words, that thought. It's, it's good for us not to hurry through the Bible a lot. Sometimes just put it in park and stay in a place and think. As I came to verse 52 and 53, Jesus said, I was with you daily. I was there every day. And you didn't stretch your hand against me then. But now, this is your hour. The power of darkness, and I have to sort of de declare unto you the uh, the argument that I went in, that went on in my mind. I thought, well, was Jesus saying that for this particular span of time that he had given up his control? I mean, does it really say to us that for an hour Satan was in charge? Is it saying to us that for an hour or for a day darkness was in charge? And understanding, as the Bible tells us, verse upon verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, we know that God is omnipotent and he is the authority of this world and he is always sovereign over all things that happen here. God does not give up control, not for one second. Not for one second does God give up control. But I believe when Jesus said, this is your hour, He's actually saying this, my father has allowed you to operate for this hour. Now let's just take a moment to think. If it was the father that was allowing them to operate for one hour, who's still really in charge? God is. God is. And I want us to sort of look at that thought today if we can. Jesus had entered into Jerusalem. He had been hailed as the Messiah. We studied that weeks ago. His entrance into Jerusalem, the crowd thought it would be the place where he would make his stand and would conquer Rome. In other words, this entrance is going to be uh, a victory for the Jews and defeat for the Roman Empire. And we're going to take our nation back and our city back. We're going to take our land back. But there was something much bigger going on. We all know that. There was something much bigger happening. Jesus was not entering Jerusalem that day to get victory over Rome. He was entering into Jerusalem that day to get the victory over our sin. Amen. He was not entering as a conquering one. He was entering as a suffering one. As John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, remember he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was entering into Jerusalem as a lamb. Now someday he will come back as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We know that from the book of Revelation. He will return. But it wasn't that day. He was entering as the embodiment of the redemption of mankind. And like of old, when Abraham was offering his son, and God stayed the, the, the incident and said, Abraham, don't do this to your son. And Abraham looked over and there was a there was a ram caught in the thicket. And it was earlier that day before they made the travel up the mountain that Abraham prophetically said to his son when Isaac said, well, I see the fire and we've got the wood and we've got everything, but there is no lamb. And powerfully and prophetically, Abraham said, God shall provide himself a lamb. It doesn't say God shall provide for himself a lamb. The Bible says God shall provide himself a lamb. And so he did on this day. It is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, becoming the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. The betrayer has been exposed, that's earlier in the chapter, as they're having this meal and this Passover meal together. Judas has been revealed as the betrayer. Judas departs from the meal. 
And he leaves to set in motion the lucrative plans. 30 pieces of silver, all the money he's going to make. All the, 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 this plan is going to be great, 30 pieces of silver. And he set in motion his lucrative plans to entrap Jesus. And Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to pray. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane. I was there. Some of you that went with us on the trip to uh, the Holy Land to Israel. That garden is an amazing place. One of the highlights of the trip. It's a garden just on the, you know, these physical features are still there. A, a mount that has many olive trees and olive presses and olive, uh, uh, olive yards uh, uh, there. And, and this garden, which is very nigh to it, is, is somewhat easy to go through the Bible story and see the, the, the movement uh, there according to that land. The terrain hasn't changed much is what I'm saying. And you go into that garden, and one of the most amazing things about the Garden of Gethsemane is olive trees can live for thousands of years. And some of these olive trees, you can look it up online if you have the time in the, in the next few days or this afternoon. Some of these olive trees are so, they're, they're very short trees, they don't grow tall, but some of them are so large you, can't, you, couldn't, you couldn't hug the tree, it's, it, the trunk is just too large. And these trees grow year after year after year. And our guide that was there said that they've done the dating on these trees. And there are some of these trees that would have been there at the very same time that Jesus prayed in that garden. So Jesus went there to pray. I still remember that day in the Garden of Gethsemane. We, you know, sort of a fun trip. We're laughing and joking. But when we got to the garden, everybody just split up and took a chance praying somewhere in that garden. Jesus is praying to his father knowing that this is the day, this is the time that I will give my life a ransom for many. He prays, he takes with him a few of his closest followers, he asks them to pray, and then with the rawness of humanity, they fall asleep. Luke records for us that they fell asleep for sorrow, that was unique uh, sort of my study of this particular book. I didn't catch that in other places where it's talked about. They were sleepy from sorrow. Have you ever been so sad that all you wanted to do was sleep? And obviously these disciples felt. They felt the chaos of this situation. They felt the oppression. No doubt they felt the oppression of this time. And Jesus was praying so much that his sweat was like drops of blood on his forehead. And they are so sorrowful, they fall asleep. We can sort of understand their, their humanity here. The question I have is, as Judas enters into the garden, and Judas, along with the soldiers and with the chief priests, and arrests Jesus, who's really in control? In all the chaos and turmoil, who's really in control? Is Judas in control? After all, it was his plan, right? Everything's working according to his plan. He must have known sort of where Jesus would go. He must have known that this was a place where he resorts to pray. Or maybe it was disclosed. Maybe he had heard Jesus say, that's where I'm going to pray after we have our meal. This was his plan. And with all of the tension uh, and unrest Maybe this was Judas's way of bringing some control to the situation again. This was the night he chose. This was the location he chose. In fact, look at uh, verse number 6 of chapter 22 uh, in this same chapter, but back several verses, where when he conspired with the chief priests and the scribes, in verse 6 says, He promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them. Now notice this, in the absence of the multitude. And this is what the religious crowd wanted. We don't want to arrest him with a lot of people around. Judas, you've got to get him alone. You've got to find a place where he's alone, and then we'll arrest him. We don't want the bad PR of arresting this man whom the crowds have just enter, you know, welcomed into our city, and the crowds are listening to him in the temple. We, we don't want the bad PR of that, so get him alone. This was Judas's plan. This was the place he chose. This was the night he chose. It was even the method he chose with a kiss. Whose idea was that? It was Judas's idea. That's how I'll do it. I'll kiss him and then they'll know that that's the time to arrest him. Do any of us possibly think this morning 
that somehow Jesus was caught in Judas's trap? Of course not. Judas wasn't in control. He thought he was. Right? I think that's fair to say. He thought he was. But he wasn't in control. Not for a moment. How about the chief priests and the scribes? Were they in control? After all, they had the position. They're the ones that had the influence. They were the ones that could pull the strings. They were the ones that had the money. I mean, who was, who was paying Judas? It was the chief priests and the scribes. They had the money and they had the political connections. They could pull the strings of Pilate and Herod and, 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 the, and the Sanhedrin. And, and, and they were able to pull the strings. They were able to pull the strings of the court and the trial and the mockery of a trial. Were they the ones in control? Did they finally outsmart him? Did, did they finally figure out a way to, to outsmart the Son of God? I think we all know today. No, they didn't outsmart him. Not for a moment. They didn't outsmart him. I'll ask also, was Rome in control? Rome was the muscle. The chief priests knew that when they were going to arrest Jesus, they better have some soldiers there. So they brought the soldiers. And they had the muscle. And they had the, the uh, Pilate was Rome's puppet. Pilate was the Roman governor, and, and Pilate was, was uh, interviewing Jesus uh, sometime later and, and interrogating him and moving him from place to place and sending him to Herod, and he's coming back. Was Rome in control? Was the, was the empire of Rome the one that was really moving and, and, and making things happen here? I, I also want to mention one more. Was Peter in control? I think Peter wanted to control this thing. That's why he drew out a sword. I think Peter thought this thing is going a little sideways. You know, it's not going the way we wanted it to go. And it's not going the way I told Jesus it would go. Because I told him that this would not happen. That I would not allow this to happen. That I would not stand by while this happened. And so Peter takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest's soldier. Maybe Peter thought, I'll fix it. I'll control the situation. Well, by Jesus healing that ear, we know that Peter wasn't in control. And Jesus said, put up your sword. You know what's amazing to me? In all the chaos and turmoil of this night of all nights, no night like it ever in human history, in all of the pain and confusion of the night, the only one that's calm is Jesus. Peter denies him three times and runs away in isolation. He doesn't want to see anybody. He's weeping and crying. He's not calm. The chief priests and the scribes, they're all twisted up in their, in their own pride and, and arrogance and wondering, is this going to work? What are we going to do? We've got to find some false witnesses. And they're running, running hither and yon to put together a mockery of a trial. They're all in, in confusion. Pilate is wringing his hands of the situation. Even Pilate's wife is having bad dreams about the whole thing. You know the story. She, she's oh, she, she's a, uh, unraveled on the inside. Pilate's unraveled. He's washing his hands of the whole situation, trying to clear his guilty conscience. Judas went out and hung himself. That was his guilt. The only calm one is Jesus. And he's the one suffering. He's the one going to Calvary. Jesus said, this is your hour. This is the hour that my father is allowing you to do this. When I was daily, you stretched forth no hand against me. But this is your hour. I want to read a scripture about Pilate. Pilate said unto Jesus, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? You know what Jesus answered? Thou couldst have no power over me at all. Except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee 
hath the greater sin. The calm one is Jesus. I want to ask you this question. Why, as Christians, do we fall into unrest? I've been in the ministry for a while, and um, I'm not saying that I'm exempt from this, but I am seeing it more and more, where the calmness and the restfulness and the confidence that a Christian should have is not there. Do you know how we get rest? Do you know how we find the kind of rest that Jesus portrayed for us here? When he walked in this flesh, he was giving us an example of how we walk in this flesh. So in verse 42, I want to read verse number 42 again and just say a few words about verse number 42. In his prayer, which is only a few words as recorded according to Luke, more is recorded in other Gospels. But verse 42, this was his prayer. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And here's just the simple truth that I want to share with you before we close that I believe will change a Christian's life, that will change your life. Do you know how you find rest? It's when you say, not my will, but your will. And by the way, that's the only way to find rest. Because as much as our human side, our, our carnal side, our mortal side... Let's just be honest. We want to control it. We want to drive. We want to be the pilot. We want to be the one who guarantees our own peace. But has anybody else learned this same truth with me? The more I try to get my peace, the more I don't have it. And the more I try to generate my own rest the more it eludes me. Because Jesus knew that in order to have calmness and rest through this unusual day, this day of days, this, this day like no other on this planet, he prayed, not my will, thine be done. See, because all of us, we have our own little kingdom. Here's the fact. You got your own little kingdom. It's your kingdom your life. It's your heart. It's my will. We've got our own little kingdom. And we'll never have rest and we'll never have calmness until we surrender that kingdom. Amen. It must be surrendered. When our kingdom and our will is surrendered to his great kingdom and his great will that's when the Bible says, he that findeth his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Not my will, but thine be done. It's about alignment and it's about submission. Jesus knew that Judas could do nothing unless his father allowed it. Jesus knew that the chief priest could do nothing unless his father allowed it. Jesus knew that Pilate had no power unless his father allowed it. Jesus knew that no soldier could have any harm toward him unless his father allowed it. And Jesus aligned, being the Son of God, the Son of Man, aligned God's will, his will, with God's will. And there's rest. There's rest. To fully embrace God's desires and not ours. Has anyone here, like myself, had some old cars and have ever driven one that was really, really bad out of alignment? Anybody? Right? There's a few old car drivers here. <laughs> I have driven some bad ones. 
I think I still have a couple of bad ones. And when a car is out of alignment, there are two forces at play. One force that is at play is one of those wheels, one of those front wheels, the tie rod or something has been turned out, right, Claude, too many turns. Somebody didn't count the threads. And they turned that out too many turns. And so when these two front wheels should be straight, one or both are wanting their desire. You in the seat want your desire because there's that ditch over there on the right side. So you want your desire this way. Now we can all endure a little bit of a, of a car that's maybe a little bit out of alignment, but I've driven some bad ones and I can testify you just want to park it and be done because it is not enjoyable to drive. It is not at all comfortable to drive. The entire trip is a fight. The entire trip is stress. The entire trip is fighting the pull, fighting the pull, fighting the pull, fighting the pull, fighting the pull. But if you have been like me and maybe scraped up enough money to take it to a front end alignment place and tell them put it on the machine or take your measure tape out and put this thing back straight, and when you pick it up, having paid $300 or $400, and you begin to drive, it, wow, what a difference. What a difference. You know why Judas was in turmoil? Because he was following his will, not God's. You know why the chief priests were in turmoil? Because he was following his will, not God's. You know why Pilate couldn't sleep and his wife couldn't sleep? You know why Pilate's wringing his hands in a basin of water? You know, that's sort of where we get this, uh, this, uh, this movement. It's Pilate rinsing the guilt, rinsing the guilt off. You know why he's so guilty? Because he was following his will and not the Father's. And I'm saying this for us as Christians today. The greatest pathway, the only pathway of peace and rest is saying, Lord, not my will, but thine. I trust you. I honor you. You are my Lord. Not my will, but thine be done. To have full confidence in all that the Father allows, all that filters through his fingers, is of his good and perfect will. Because sin pulls everything out of alignment. And pride pulls everything out of alignment. To trust the end result. I read an article about the Cuyahoga River, and I, to be honest, I've lived in this area my whole life, and I never really looked at a map of the Cuyahoga River. If you go and look at a map of the Cuyahoga River, the Cuyahoga River flows which direction? Well, let's say for the most part, which way? North. But it's almost 50% another direction. South. So if you look at a map of Ohio, we're sort of, you know, looking at it from your perspective, it starts over here and it looks like a U-shape. Cuyahoga River goes down and then goes back up toward Lake Erie. And along the path, it's going east and west and south and north and east and west and north and south. In fact, the word Cuyahoga means crooked. Right? Snake crooked, yeah. It means crooked. And so the Cuyahoga River goes every direction, but it has one destination. But I've learned in this life, I can't always figure out God's every move in my life. Right? Can you? I can't always figure out everything he does. I feel like sometimes my life is going east and sometimes it's going west. And to take the metaphor all the way, sometimes it's going north and then sometimes it's really going south. But my Lord knows the destination. He knows the end. And the only way to have calmness on a river that's going every direction is to trust the one who knows the destination. Not my will, but thine be done. 
in this time of virus and corona, in this time of elections and taxes and immigration and abortion, different church settings. I'm, these are just some current examples I'm saying. Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And you'll find rest. You'll find rest. There is a greater virus that's here. It's called sin. This great virus, sin, is your declared independence from God. It's saying, I can do it myself. I don't need you. I don't need anything. I will make my own way. And that virus, which is called sin, the Bible portrays it this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's no immunity to sin. It infects 100% of humanity. But Jesus came to save us from our sin, the Bible says. And God the Son, Jesus Christ, aligned his will with his Father's will. And together, it was the greatest act of grace and love and sacrifice the world has ever seen. The good dying for the unjust. The sinless dying for the sinner. God dying for man. Are you saved today? Are you born again? It may be this morning you finally realized, or maybe, maybe it has been realized before. Here's the reason why someone doesn't get saved. Once they've heard the gospel. It's because their will will not align with the Father's will. We're not willing to say, not my will, thine be done. We want to say, my will, not yours. Because, I'll close this way, what is the Father's will? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what he wants. That's what Jesus wants. Can we align our will with his there's a song in our hymn book that sometimes we sing for an invitation, and I think we'll do it today. Many of you will know it. It's a song that's called, Is You're All on the Altar. Do you know that song? It's page 156. I want to read a little bit before we sing it. I want us to read the words, and then we'll sing it. Have a time of prayer. I know this isn't Bible today, this is a hymn, but I'm telling you these hymns have great doctrine in them. Look if you would at verse number, or, yeah, verse number one. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. Now look here, but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control? You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. I don't know what inspired Elisha Hoffman to pen these words and to put together this melody. But I'm telling you the truth that is written here is a solid Christian Bible truth. You will never have rest until you surrender your will to his will. Never. Never have peace. You'll run like a Judas, hide like a Peter, be torn up inside like the chief priests, and filled with guilt like a pilot until you yield him your body and your soul. Can we bow our heads for a moment for prayer? I'll ask Pastor Townhill to come and lead us in prayer today and then we'll sing this song and have an invitation. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come to you at this time of invitation. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would move among the congregation, Father, Lord, that they would leave their seat even now, Lord, if they do not know you as their Savior, if they don't have that peace with God. 
pray, Lord, that you'd speak to hearts this morning, Father. And for the Christian that doesn't have the peace of God the way we should, it's because we're being disobedient. Lord, help us to be in line with your word. Or life will wear on us if we're not in line with your will, Father. So we cast our burdens at your feet this morning and pray that you bless this time of invitation. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we all stand with our hymn books at 156 as we sing? We're going to sing all four verses today. I say that because you'll have time to pray. If you want to use the altar, you want to kneel where you are and pray, want to pray with a friend, pray with myself, pray with Pastor Matt. If you're unsaved, you come. But let's sing these verses today. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly first.
seated, everybody. Pastor Talna will finish up for us today. We have our ushers come forth this time. It's been a wonderful Sunday morning, amen? amen. So wonderful to hear the preaching of God's word and to know the Savior, he's the one in control. We just need to yield to him, amen, for that peace. We have peace with God, but not always the peace of God. That's when we're going our own way and not his way. God help us, amen. Brothers, thank us. Could you leave some prayer for the offering, please? Lord, we do thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your word and the confidence we have in it, Lord. We thank you that you never fail, Lord, and you're always there, Lord, for salvation. Lord, guide us and direct, bless this church, bless this time. Lord, use the money as uh, you see fit that we may just further your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Go to some things in the bulletins. Uh, beginning with our ICE Festival taking place February 19th through the 21st, we're asking that people sign up in the back to be at our sculpture. And um, we're looking forward to just, just getting the gospel out and um, seeing souls saved as a result of that. Amen. And Christians encouraged. But we're going to be there at the Medina Square. The time is listed there. So please sign up in the hallway in the lobby before you leave uh, for a time slot. Uh, you'll be able to help only a group of two. Um, is kind of encouraged because of their, um, there's some um, restrictions there because of the COVID and all that, you know, the things that you guys know that are taking place now. So pray about that. We know that God will use that. Um, also, you can see in your bulletin, so we've got a new announcement here, our continued discipleship. And basically what this is is just a 26 lessons on Bible doctrine. It will be going to take about six months to go through the, uh, through, uh, the, through the series, and we encourage you to be a part of that on Wednesdays here at the church. So if you'd like to um, get involved in that class, please see me and let me know about it. If you have any questions concerning that, I feel, um, feel free to ask me, and I can fill you in on some of the details concerning that class. We're excited about it. We're looking forward to it. And a Bible doctrine is so important for us to know, amen? And we just encourage you to be a part of that class, and um, we know it's going to be a blessing as God teaches us his word through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're looking forward to that. Pray about all these things that take place at Southwest Baptist Church, the meetings, the, the, our, our ministries here. We're looking forward to our haven of rest taking place this Tuesday. Go to be here at the church. If you'd be, uh, like to go with us on the bus, be here at the church at 5 o'clock. We'll be leaving right around 15 after 5, maybe 5.30 at the latest. And um, we can wait here for you and um, just be here for that. We know that would be a blessing. God is doing a great work. I pray for Brother Neil Sargent. He'll be preaching tomorrow night. And I pray that God would just um, put his words in his mouth and that we'll see salvation decisions as a result of it. But prayer is vitally important. Amen. So pray for the ministries of our church and pray for these things that are taking place, for people to be stirred, for people to be saved. Amen. And it's so, so important for us to do that together as, as Christians, as a family. And we know that God's doing a great work here at this church. Of course, things taking place this week, our midweek service, our Bible study also Sunday on Wednesday mornings at 930 on the book of Romans. We're still on Romans. We got up to chapter 8. But we're, we're getting through it, and um, praise God for it, amen. So just be there if you can for that. And many other Bible studies are taking place here at the church. If you have any questions about that, you can see one of the deacons or see the pastor or myself, and we can let you know and fill you in some of the other studies that take place throughout the week also. Um, also, Volunteer's Day Project, uh, for our shut-ins and our seniors, we'd like to ask you to get involved in that as we make out some cards for them, and we get that to them to encourage them. And, of course, we need, uh, we need the cars in by February 10th. And, of course, um, uh, on the counter in the back, I believe it's the bag, Valentine's Day bag back there. Leave those in there. And we know that would be a blessing to those that receive it. And also, we need help with deliveries, as you can see in your bulletins. If you can make yourself available and be a blessing, that would be mildly appreciated for deliveries on February 11th here at the church at 1 o'clock. So please be here for that. We know that would be a blessing. Um, tonight, there's going to be fellowships and refresh, uh, fellowship and refreshments with tacos. And we're looking forward to a good time of fellowship tonight. Amen. So be here at the church tonight, come back here preaching God's word, and be encouraged, be stirred, and afterwards, just as important, having that fellowship one with another. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, amen? And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So be here tonight for fellowships from taco, um, tacos and a nacho bar, so we're looking forward to that, amen? When stand, will you dismiss in a word of prayer? And praise God for his word this morning, and for preaching, amen? amen. And let's pray. Dear Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Father. We thank you for each and every family that is here this morning, that's present, Father. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. And nothing happens by chance or by accident, Lord, but it was your will that all of us be here this morning and hear this message. We pray for Brother Henry Hall, Father, and for the Hall family. Mm -hmm. As soon as with you now rejoicing in heaven, she's in your presence now. One day that's where all we're going to all be heading if we're saved, if we're born again. Lord, so pray that you please be with Henry and just give him peace as they go through this time. And that it's not goodbye, it's just I'll see you later. We'll see you again, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your promise that you are coming again. May today be even that very day that you come, Father, to the, 
rapture, the trumpet will sound, Lord, and we'll be raptured out of here. We're so excited, Lord, about what you got in store for us today. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done and all you've done.